Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of National Invasive Species Awareness Week. It's lovely to see you all here today. What a great audience that is still joining us. So I'm going to slowly get us started here. My name is Belle Bergner. I'm the Executive Director of the North American Invasive Species Management Association. It's so great to see where everyone's coming from, and I see some familiar names in the chat. People from Florida to Minnesota and Washington all over the continent. We're so glad you're here. Today's webinar is going to be fantastic. It is entitled Climate Change and Invasive Species. We have Carrie Brown Lima from the New York Invasive Species Research Institute at Cornell University, Brendan Querian from Cornell University, Lee Greenwood from the Nature Conservancy, and Dr. Emily Fusco from the USDA Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station. So I'm going to give just a little bit of intro about NASMA, and then we'll get started with the webinar. So for those who don't know us, we are, our mission is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. We do a lot of things, and if you have never participated in any of our programs, please check us out on our website after the webinar. We are stewards of international standards, including mapping, invasive species mapping standards, certified weed-free products. We facilitate education and advocacy, including National Invasive Species Awareness Week, which brought you all here today. Um, our public outreach and awareness program is called Play Clean Go. We have turnkey outreach and education and prevention tools available for anyone to download and use right on from our website. And finally, we do professional development, including webinars, trainings, certification programs, and our annual conference. Speaking of our annual conference, please save the dates for November 7th to the 10th. We will be down in Fort Myers, Florida this fall. We are very much looking forward to it. We are working with the Florida Invasive Species Council. They are our co-host or um, definitely save your dates and join us there. So again, today is day two of National Invasive Species Awareness Week. If you have not checked out our other webinars this week, please do. Here's the list. I won't list them all right now so that we can get our presenters going today. But um, you can still, there is still time to register for the rest of the webinars this week. And finally, there are lots of opportunities to get involved. Let's go to nisa.org or go to our website nasma.org. There are policy pages with action alerts. You can sign a letter that is, we have a template ready to go with several action alerts. You can share those with your members and colleagues. And there are over 70 events taking place all over North America for National Invasive Species Awareness Week. It's just amazing. Invite your colleagues and elected officials to these webinars. Great opportunity to just bring people together and make sure everyone has the opportunity to learn about these topics. There is a free resource toolkit there, which provides easy ways for you to promote NISA. There are downloadable social media graphics and other graphics, a press release template. Go check it out if you haven't. And finally, if you're on social, please tag at Invasive Species Week on Facebook and hashtag NISA. Sign up for alerts and reminders if you aren't already on our list. There's also opportunities to sponsor or donate to support this work that we do. And join NASMA as a member if you are not already. And so with that, I am going to turn off my slides and turn it over to our first presenter, Carrie Brown Lima from the New York Invasive Species Research Institute. Thanks so much. It's such an honor to be here, to be a part of the National Invasive Species Awareness Week webinar series. Thanks so much to NASMA for hosting and making this all happen. My name is Carrie Brown Lima, and I'm going to be kicking off this session by giving an overview of climate change and invasive species and some of the interactions. And then we'll be taking a deep dive into a couple of the ways that invasive species and climate change are interaction with my colleagues, Brendan Quarian, Lee Greenwood, and Emily Fusco. So I'm going to present this overview, and I'd like to acknowledge first off that a lot of what I'm talking about today and some of the information I'm providing is actually a collective effort of the Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network, and that's an effort that's led by Bethany Bradley from University of Massachusetts, 
and Tony Limarelli from the Northeast CASC, as well as myself um, from the New York Invasive Species Research Institute. So as I'm getting started on this topic, I just want to go back to about five or six years ago when I first became interested and started delving into this issue. Back in 2016, President Obama issued the amendment to the Executive Order on Invasive Species. And in this amendment, he included the fact that impacts of climate change should be considered when working on issues related to invasive species. Right around this same time, my stakeholders here in New York State were asking for more research and information on how they could manage for upcoming biological invasions in light of climate change since the objective of the research institute that I run is to be this bridge between science and management. In more recent times, this whole interest in this issue was confirmed when this paper came out last year as well, that all the top scientists, or not all of them, but many of the top scientists across the globe were identifying climate change as a priority area for invasion in science, and that we should be really during this as we're thinking about it moving forward. And for the purpose of today's talk, I'm not going to go really deep into the indicators of climate change or how we know climate change is happening. But really what I'd like to do is just briefly touch on some of the ways, some of the important aspects of climate change that are relevant to our conversation on invasive species, or at least the ones that we know about. So We've all heard, I'm sure, that CO2 levels are rising at an unprecedented rate. They're higher now than ever before. And even though we need CO2 in our environment so that we're not an icebox here on Earth, greater levels provide this greenhouse effect that are then heating up our planet, which leads us to the fact that climate change is associated with an average temperature rise. And here in New York State, where I'm located, we're looking at a change of two to five degrees over the next 50 years on average. And then that could give us a climate more similar to some of the southern states. Not only are the temperatures on average warmer, our seasons are shifting. So I'm sure many of you have noticed that spring is coming earlier, winter is coming later, and is shorter and milder. And these milder winters are great for growing seasons, but they also have given us earlier spring, snow melting, less snow overall, lake ice is forming later, melting earlier, really interrupting some of our winter sports here in the Northeast for sure. And in addition, we're also seeing increasing frequency of temperature and precipitation extremes. So heavier, more intense rains, greater droughts or frost freezing, and also an increase and in intensity of extreme weather events, such as hurricanes, flooding, and heat waves and droughts that are causing fires in the West. So together, these conditions that we're seeing as a result of climate change are making invasive, giving invasive species more of a competitive edge over their native counterparts. I mentioned the rising CO2 levels, and anyone who participated in their biology classes would know that plants do love CO2, and they can grow more quickly and larger under higher CO2 conditions. This photo, this photo series shows ambient CO2 conditions compared to future predicted CO2 conditions, and we can see that, the, that this tree is growing taller and faster under higher CO2. However, invasive plant species, even though native species are also able to take advantage of rising CO2 conditions, invasive species are able to do that even better. So this work by Cascade Sorten from 2013 compared the ability of invasive plants to native plants to take advantage of higher CO2. And as you can see from this figure here, they are indeed able to have a larger advantage under higher CO2 conditions. These warming temperatures that we're talking about and we're seeing are actually opening up and melting Arctic ice and opening up a direct route for invasive species introduction, at least here on the East Coast, and for in invasive species to be introduced into an area that was previously less accessible to invasives, such as the Arctic. Our milder winters 
are allowing for earlier spring and earlier green up. But what we're seeing is that because invasive species are such great adapters and they are really plastic and can take advantage of new conditions, they're actually able to respond more quickly to this earlier spring, as we can see from this work done back in 2011, much more quickly than their native counterparts. So the early bird really does get the worm in this case because they're able to come in, take advantage of resources in sunlight and get the leg up on our native species. And this isn't only happening in terrestrial environments. We're also seeing these warmer temperatures give a competitive advantage to introduce species in the aquatic systems. For example, here in the Northeast, our native brook trout are really valued to anglers and are a great um, part of our stream ecosystems. And under normal cooler water conditions, they can now compete or compete with um, introduced brown trout. However, as soon as the temperature goes up, studies are showing that brown trout can outcompete native brook trout for resources and habitat. And this is also happening with aquatic plant species. Eurasian water milfoil is able to expand its growing season and respond to longer growing season, reproducing longer, becoming larger, expanding its population as compared to its na native milfoil species. So not only are, is the warming temperature an advantage to those species, introduced species that are already present, it's also allowing some introduced species, invasive species, to shift their range, ranges farther north, those that were previously limited by cold temperatures. And we can see this with plant species. And in fact, Jenica Allen and Bethany Bradley back in 2016 projected which species were likely to move in, move north based on climate projections and found that the Northeast and the upper Midwest were likely to have be future invasion hotspots for invasive plant species. And we're not only seeing this happen with plants, we're also seeing this happen with other taxa. Um, for example, forest pests are normally limited by cold temperatures, by the coldest night of the year, and by real drops in temperature, rapid drops in temperature. And since we have been having these mild winters, species like hemlock willi adelgid, that was previously thought to not be able to move into the more northern regions, is now making its march north. If you look at these distribution maps from 1997 and the distribution of hemlock willi adelgid, and then you compare that to 2020, we can see a great expansion into the north. In fact, here in New York, biologists had said at one point that there'd be no way that hemlock willi adelgid would be able to survive in our mountainous Adirondack region. And in the past few years, it's definitely there. It's become established and it's spreading. And so this, we're going to continue to be threatened in, in higher latitudes by invasive forest pests. Again, it's not limited to terrestrial environments. We're seeing species such as water hyacinth and Asian clam also make the march north. I also mentioned that there was going to be a change in, or that there has been a change in ice melts and the amount of ice we have. And this, the amount of ice actually changes disturbance regimes that could favor invasive species. For example, Didymo, also known as rock snot, is thought to have been scoured by ice that would remove it and keep its populations in check. And now with less ice to scour the bottoms of our streams, its populations are able to expand and it becomes more problematic. And in addition to plants and animals, and we are seeing an increased spread and in impact of wildlife and human diseases. And partially that's due to their vectors. For example, the Asian tiger mosquito, which is more of a, a warmer climate species, is able to survive farther north and therefore spread some of the diseases it carries, such as dengue fever, to new latitudes. But we also have existing wildlife diseases such as white nose syndrome that's been around for decades, but now is able to spread more rapidly and have a larger impact on its target bat species. Now, this is not always the case. So as you can see from this projections that Bethany Bradley and Jenica Allen put out, there are regions that are going to see a decrease in species. Now, those are species that are already in existence here and not including new introductions into the country, but it's not always 
an advantage. So I just wanted to point out that this is species and context specific in some species like the formerly known European gypsy moth caterpillar is, in, is now not able to survive at the southern part of its range, range as much and is retracting its range northward. And in addition to the warming temperatures, I mentioned that highlighted the fact that we're going to have an increase in extreme events, and this will provide new opportunities for invasive species. For example, hurricanes that open up tree canopies by, as you can see here in the photo from Hurricane Katrina, there was a great canopy loss um, that was documented in this study by Brown et al. in 2011. And what came in afterwards was that was a real great expansion of an invasive understory plant bush blackberry here. So we can see in 2006, post Katrina, we saw a real big jump in, in blackberry in the understory. Also, this warmer climate plus drought is stressing out trees more and helping us, helping pests become more abundant and be more successful in killing their host species. C. Frank and his grad student at the time, Adam Dale, down at North Carolina State University, did a really interesting study um, looking at gloomy scale, which is actually a native pest on sugar, on red maples. And what they did was they used city um, to simulate future climate because cities tend to be a couple degrees warmer than the surrounding rural areas. And so they took they prevented some of these city trees from getting sufficient water to simulate warmer temperature and drought conditions and produced or had a present gloomy scale and then compared that to the gloomy scale on trees that were outside of the city that were slightly cooler and were allowed to get appropriate amounts of water. And what they found is that the warmer, more drought stressed trees actually harbored more successful pests than the cooler, less drought stressed trees. And so what their predictions are based on this study is that as cities and natural habitats become hotter and drier with more drought, these damaging pests will become more abundant. And also thinking about some other considerations related to invasive species and climate change are that is that of sleeper species. And so among us, among our in our habitats, we have invasive species, but we also have some non-native species that are not really harmful. We just call them like naturalized species that are just there coexisting among with among the native species. But a lot of times these species are actually limited by climate. And so as the climate warms and becomes more favorable, some of these species could actually become invasive and their populations could grow. So these sleeper species, as we call them, then are awoken by appropriate climate conditions. There are some examples of this and kind of a classic example that comes from the UK is the acorn barnacle. It was just there hanging out for about 50 years. And then after a series of mild winters, its population was able to explode and it became invasive and it started out competing its native counterparts for habitat and resources. And we have species here that we really need to be keeping our eye out for that might be suspected sleeper species, that might be sleeper species moving forward. And there's some really great research coming out of the risk group that will identify some of these. And you should see that in the coming months. Another consideration we have for, for climate change and invasive species is that some of our existing control methods may not be as effective under future CO2 or temperature conditions. This cool work that Lou Ziska did back in 2004 compared the efficacy of glyphosate to control Canada thistle. And as you can see from these photos, under normal CO2 conditions, Glyphosate was highly effective and removed most of the Canada thistle. However, the same amount of Canada thistle under future CO2 was not able to be as controlled as, as effectively. And as we pointed out earlier, terrestrial invasive plants are able to take advantage of CO2 and become more numerous and larger. So that is not a surprising thing, but it's also something that we're going to have to think about the tools in our toolkit to control invasives under future climate conditions. And that's not just the case for herbicides. 
We do have a lot of great biological controls out there right now and those under research to control invasive plant and insect populations. However, with climate warming, we're su suspecting that there could be some decoupling of the match between the biological control and its target invasive. And I think in the future years, we're gonna see some really interesting research coming out because so much is being published on it already. But some of the suspected interactions or changes that we might see happen due to climate change are that the phenology, the timing of the target invasive species with its biocontrol agent could be decoupled. There could be a change in growth and reproductive rate of both in the agents and target species or the actual range, as we're talking about range shifting due to the climate, due to climate change might actually cause a geographical mismatch. Also, and this has been a topic of, uh, that comes up a lot, probably in about every talk I give, is what do we do about native species that then start shifting their ranges and maybe behaving uh, an invasive species and outcompeting its other native? And so we've coined this nuisance neonatives. They're native range shifting species that have established themselves behind, beyond their historical range and are causing some sort of damage. And an example of that is the black locust, although we have many others that are following in the tracks of this. And I think it'll be a really interesting discussion among land managers on how we actually treat these natives that are actually just seeking climate refuge as well. I won't go deeply into this, I've talked quite a bit about how climate change impacts native species, invasive species, but invasive species can also play a role in influencing climate change. And Brendan and Lee will be going more into depth on a really neat study they just published last year, looking at how reducing, how forest pests can actually reduce our ability to sequester carbon. And so I look forward to that in a couple of minutes, uh, hearing more about that work. Also on our lineup today, we'll have Emily Fusco talking about how invasive grasses can actually increase fire occurrence and frequency across the Seco regions. And really looking at the fact that climate change, we're seeing more drought, we're seeing more fire. And then we add in these high, highly flammable invasive grasses that are going to make this problem even worse. Just to recap before I pass the baton along here, climate change is opportunities for invasive species offer increased growth and density of invasives due to higher CO2, hardier invasives that it show resistance to herbicide, potential reduction in efficacy of biocontrols, earlier green up in priority effects for invasives, northward shifts of invasives, new establishment of invasives due to increased disturbance, waking up sleeper invasive species, loss of carbon storage opportunities, increased fire, facilitating the spread of wildlife and human diseases, and um, these native species becoming a nuisance. So I, I will wrap up with that. I just wanted to point out this great resource from the Risk Network that really goes over some of these interactions that I just discussed. And if you go to risknetwork.org, which I'll touch on in my wrap up, you can see some a summary of what I just presented. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing screen then. Brendan and Lee. And our next speaker will be Brendan Crarian from Cornell University. Brendan, whenever you're ready, you can start sharing. Can I just get confirmation that you're seeing my screen in presenter view? Perfect. Great. Thanks so much, Carrie and Belle and Elizabeth for hosting this again. Uh, my name is Brendan Quarian. I'm a graduate student at Cornell University. And I'm going to be presenting on the research that Carrie touched on that was published late last year called Insect and Disease Disturbances Correlate with reduced carbon sequestration in forests of the contiguous United States. This was an effort that I led in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Forestry, Purdue University, and I'm missing one, U.S. Forest Service.
let me dive in here. Hopefully my screens will advance. So it should probably go without saying, but um, carbon sequestration all comes down to this chemical equation. And that's the chemical equation for photosynthesis. And in this process, a large, large amounts of carbon dioxide are sequestered from the atmosphere and stored in plant materials. And trees are especially important in this regard because they store that carbon in wood, which persists on the landscape for large periods of time or long periods of time. And that stored carbon eventually makes its way into other pools, which also persist for long periods of time. Things like dead and downed woody debris and soils. So, uh, there's been a lot of interest in promoting forests as a natural climate solution in um, combating climate change, trying to use forests to harness carbon sequestration and climate change mitigation. So it shouldn't be surprising that if thing affects a plant's ability to sequester carbon or photosynthesize, then we're going to have lower carbon sequestration rates. And those disturbances can be anything from fire, which Emily will talk about later on, to wind events, to geologic events, non-native species, and deer. What I'm going to be talking about are insects and diseases. And so we know that Insects and diseases have been increasing in abundance and severity across the United States. So this is work from Lee Bold et al. in, in 2013 that shows the accumulation of non-native forest pests and pathogens across the United States. And this is work from the U.S. Forest Service that shows the increased prevalence of native forest pests, such as pine beetles, affecting the western United States. We also know that the trends do not look positive as far as what we can expect in the future. Alcoma et al. found that the rate of accumulation for some of the, the worst forest pests and pathogens or forest pests, wood borers in particular, is actually increasing. And all insect pests are increasing in tandem with the value of our imports that are being brought into the country. Boyd et al. found a similar trend where the number of forest pests and pathogens continues to increase through time over the past 200 years. And even if we look into the future with our current safeguards against new forest pests and pathogens, things like ISPM 15, if we maintain the status quo with our current safeguards, the number of forest pests and pathogens will continue to go up. So more non-native insects and diseases are on their way. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And the question becomes, are we going to maintain that status quo or are we going to try and do something to limit their introduction into the country? So again, this, this research project that I'm going to be talking about came about through this kind of under understanding of what What's the current situation with forest pests and pathogens? Conservancy, the U.S. Forest Service, Purdue University, and the Cary Institute for assisting in this work. And the main, main research questions that we had were: one, has recent insect and disease disturbance reduced the capacity of forests to sequester carbon? Again, this was kind of like a no-brainer. We expected that they did because, again, if anything uh, reduces a plant's ability to photosynthesize, it's going to reduce its capacity. To to sequester carbon, but a more important much efforts across the United States, if not the most, the main thing we were interested in the National Forest Inventory data was the change in live tree biomass that's occurred on those plots. And we defined carbon sequestration capacity as the estimated average annual rate of carbon accumulation or biomass in live trees less than under breast height at 2.54 centimeters on unharvested forest land. And that sounds complicated, but it's really not. All we're doing is looking at the initial measure, second measurement of biomass. So that growth that's occurred over that period of time, we take the difference in those two biomass measurements and divide by the remeasurement period. So for most of our plots, it was between 2001 and 2019 when those initial measurements and second measurements occurred. And that gives us an average annual rate of change in biomass for a particular plot. And that's the primary metric that we're interested in there 
So there's two things that Brendan is about to get to in this presentation, because he and I are both co-authors on this paper. And the carbon emission equivalent of the damage that forest pests and pathogens are doing across the contiguous United States is that of 10 million personal vehicles annually per year. So he was about to say that. And then he was going to say, this is about a 9% drop in the forest sequestration capacity for the contiguous United States. And then you were all going to say to yourselves, oh my goodness, that's really serious. <laughs> How do you work to counteract this problem? And then I was going to start talking. So now you're caught. And obviously, Brendan does a much better job of that, but we'll just stick with it. So what are the implications? This is Brendan's slide. The implications are we have got to improve forest pest prevention in international trade policies, because as Brendan indicated at the beginning of the presentation, the ongoing um, introduction of forest pests and pathogens, despite all of our current regulations, is still very problematic. Next step, we've got to improve forest management of the forests that we current, currently have. One of the important things to note about this research paper is that it incorporated both native and non-native insects and diseases. And so uh, mitigating some of the forest sequest carbon sequestration losses that we saw in this paper is going to take a combination approach of both better managing the climate change exacerbated impacts of native forest pests things like southern pine beetle that are damaging more forests in farther native ranges, or mountain pine beetle that are damaging farther north and in different higher cycle points than they used to, as well as non-native forest insects and diseases that can be managed in some cases on the landscape to minimize damage. This includes forest pests like spongy moth, Lymentria dispar, which can be managed on the landscape if you have the correct tools and funding and in certain areas of the United States, but can't be managed well in other areas or if you don't have the right tools or if you don't have the funding to do so. And then additional research is needed. So this is one of the implications that we really saw here. First of all, um, Brendan was going to get into the fact that we were missing some data for particularly important areas, and we could really use additional research to cover those areas. And I'll let Brendan get back to that if he can hopefully fix his audio issue. And then additional research into better prevention strategies is also required. So there's two hold on, let me just go back for a second because I'm a little off my game here. But that first bullet point, improved forest pest prevention for international trade policies. There are two core pathways of forest pests that we know are the most problematic for, prevent, for pathways of forest pests. So therefore they are the tactics that will yield the greatest results if they are the um, preventative pathways that we work on. The first one that I will talk about briefly is, there we go, Plants for planting. So plants for planting is an entire category of plants where they are going to not be eaten. They're not going to be ground up into an oil. They're not going to be fed to an animal, but they are going to be planted in some way. And I worked on my icon use. Plants for planting don't really include little house plants, although those would be regulated as well. They do include this cute little icon in the center that has roots, that thing is intended to be planted. And they don't really include bonsais, although those do need to be regulated by their own means. So plants for planting are a pretty specific subset of all the live plants that enter the United States. There are many high risk pathways of plants for planting and types that are already regulated and have good regulations. And so the support for these regulations, the expansion of these regulations along the lines of modern trade, so new things such as direct shipping of plants, so new pathways enabled by the internet essentially, as well as new types of plants that are being brought in, and then compliance activities, making sure that the Customs and Border Protection staff and the USDA APHIS staff have adequate funding, adequate support, and adequate training in order to ensure full compliance for plants for planting pathways. Those are incredibly important. So we have some really good standing regulations for plants for planting that we should really bolster and expand according to the modern needs of international trade. 
However, there are some risky pathways and groups that remain inadequately regulated according to some of the viewpoints of watchdog organizations and conservation organizations, and even in some cases, the government entities that look at these say, like, we could improve these things. Some risky pathways definitely still are existing in the greater scope of plants for planting. So one of the examples of who should be, or sorry, what entity should be considered for potentially a new regulation that would better address modern trade and scientific understanding and sort of the yield of our research would be the highest risk genres for forest pests, which would be certain groups of woody plants. It is difficult to build regulations on host plants because of the legal frameworks. It's much easier to build regulations on high risk pests. And so you get a certain issue where you want to regulate high risk types of plants, but actually what you end up doing is hitting an administrative roadblock because what you need to do is regulate on high risk pests. So that is a place where we could improve. And wow, it really looks like I forgot a word on this slide and I'm sorry for that. There should also be new regulations on the highest risk plant materials. So for instance, there need, there, I would argue that there needs to be a greater focus on plant materials such as woody stock as opposed to unrooted stock or as opposed to seeds. So we can evaluate the different types of plants for planting that come in and look at what are the highest risk ones and are there any remaining gaps that occur? Last but not least, we also should have a really good focus on microorganisms. Microorganisms often do not get addressed as comprehensively as arthropods and macro forest pests. So in the plants for planting world, right now, a lot of our regulations are based on what we can see. But one could argue that with modern genetic technology, we could really improve our safeguarding if we also focused on what we can't see through DNA research, through high throughput genetic techniques, through eDNA, through eRNA, you name it, there's a lot of interesting technological places we could go that would trim down those risky pathways, reduce them while still allowing for international trade and still allowing for the movement of plants and planting, but making it a lot safer. The other venue that we really need to take a look at improving what we've got is solid wood packaging. All solid wood packaging that enters the United States from overseas has to be compliant with an international regulation known as ISPM 15, International Standard of Biosanitary Measure. The most common way to be uh, compliant with ISPM 15 is through heat treatment. And you can see these stamps on these beat up pallets. It's on the top right, you can just barely see the letters HT. That means that was heat treated in the US. That's that US at the top. Now, in theory, the heat treatment of pallets at the correct duration and temperature would cook every single thing in it into abs absolute oblivion. But in practice, sometimes the temperature is not reached. Sometimes the heat treatment standard is not properly adhered to or some of the pallets, but not all of the pallets in a given kiln drying event reach the correct temperature for the correct duration. Sometimes there's also active fraud where a stamp is used illegally on an untreated pallet. There's a world of opportunities for bad actors to bring in for forest pests on pallets that have not fully met the regulation. And so the implementation of the regulation to ensure that accidental non-compliance, so for instance, a kiln that has a faulty section that's too cold, or intentional non-compliance, so for instance, using a stamp, even though you haven't actually heat treated the pallet, is reduced. And historically, we've seen a tremendous number of forest pests and pathogens enter on the solid wood packaging pathway. I will note that it's often really easy to oversimplify the solid wood packaging pathway to talk about pallets specifically, and I'm guilty as charged on that because that's what you're looking at right now. But there are many other types of solid wood packaging, some of which may or may not have higher risks. So for instance, there's a type of solid wood packaging called dunnage, which is basically big blocks of wood used to prevent cargo from shifting on the ocean or inside of a truck so that it prevents damage. 
Dunnage also should be ISPM 15 compliant, heat treated or otherwise treated, stamped, et cetera. However, it is not always. Just like pallets, there's a lot of opportunities for bad actors. So making sure that we don't oversimplify the world of solid wood packaging into only pallets and incorporate risk-based approaches in future is a really big research opportunity so that we are honing in on the best possible interception rate and therefore sort of improvement possibility to prevent forest pests from entering. Now I'm getting really deep in the weeds in policy because this is National Invasive Species Awareness Week and we're here to really talk about what you can do as well as what you need to know. And what you can do is you can improve the systems that you already have. So the plants for planting systems, such as the one called NAPRA, uh, not approved testing, pending pest risk analysis, or you could work to improve ISPM 15 compliance internationally so that um, nations that are having trouble maintaining adequate heat treatment standards are given the professional guidance and support that they need by the international entities that are there to help them. Those are the things that we could do to reduce the movement of forest pests into the United States. Because when you get right down to it, preventing things from reaching North America is a lot more efficient than trying to find them because these things are very difficult to find. If you do manage to find them early through properly funding and implementing early detection systems, then that enables an effective response. And that's why you have to both prevent and early detect. And then this cascades all the way down in a conceptual framework. If you actually succeed at early detection through proper implementation and funding, you can rapidly respond. Now, not all forest pests can be eradicated. Not all forest pests can even really be managed, which is why we really should focus on prevention. But once it's here, you better bet that your best choices are to rapidly eradicate or rapidly effectively manage and really mitigate the threat. But sometimes that's no longer feasible historically. The cat is already out of the bag. And so then you have to look into long-term active management. And all of these things have high relevance to climate change because every single one of them feeds back into the loop that Brendan was talking about right at the beginning of his presentation. If we have all of this damage, we're going to have lower carbon sequestration and pe pests and pathogens are going to have larger ranges and they're going to cause more damage. So each step in the process is key to prevent additional carbon sequestration ramifications across all of North America. Then at the end of the conceptual framework, we that's overly simplified and incomplete. And I know everybody's looking at that and saying, you missed steps, of course I am. But at the end of that entire continuum, you can breed pest resistant trees. And it is critically important and it's a monumental challenge and we're doing it right now. And there's a lot of success. And that feeds back into one of Brendan's original impl impl <laughs> implication slides. And that is to say that if we manage our forests, and we plant trees, we enable things like assisted migration when appropriate and scientifically founded. When we put out pest and pathogen resistant trees through simple breeding methods like Jennifer Koch from the US Forest Service is pursuing, we actually have a chance to manage forests for better carbon sequestration, even in the face of forest pests and pathogens. Thank you, Lee. I will just confer with Elizabeth here. I think we do have time to allow Brendan to come back for a few minutes and finish up his presentation if he'd like to try to do that. Are you All hearing right. me okay now? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay. It's still saying my internet connection is unstable. I'm not really sure what's going on today with that. I just want to emphasize with this slide that the trend as far as new forest pests and pathogens arriving does not look good. Alchema et al. shows that the number of insect pests through time is increasing in coincidence with the value of imports coming into the country. And importantly, the most devastating or damaging pests, the wood borers, are actually increasing um, in, in rate of, of introduction. Similarly, Boyd et al. found a similar trend where the number is increasing through time. And as Lee just spoke about, if we just maintain the current standard of ISPM 15, we're still going to see new pests and pathogens arrive into the country. 
So more non-native insects and diseases are on their way. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And the question becomes, are we going to maintain the status quo with ISPM 15 or try and find strategic improvements to prevent new pests and pathogens from coming into the country? So this led to this research collaboration and publication I'm going to be presenting on today. I just want to thank all my collaborators at the Nature Conservancy, the U.S. Forest Service, Purdue University, and the Cary Institute. And the main questions that we had were, has recent insect and disease disturbance reduced the capacity of U.S. forests to sequester carbon? And if so, by how much? This was the first attempt to really quantify the impact that insects and diseases were having on carbon sequestration across the U.S., and that was our primary goal. And to do that, we were using National Forest Inventory data. I'm not going to go into the details of this sampling approach, but um, there's plenty of information online about this approach and the U.S. Forest Service National Forest Inventory Program. What we were primarily interested in was the change in live tree biomass that's been experience or biomass in live trees less than 2.5 centimeters dbh or diameter at breast height on unharvested forest land and that sounds complicated but at its basics you take an initial measurement on a national forest inventory plot you wait until another measurement has been recorded so you're determining the level of growth in biomass that's occurred over that period of time you take the difference in biomass measurements between those two periods of time and divide by the measurement inter interval, and that gives you an average annual rate of change um, through time. This is what we are primarily interested in as our metric in megagrams carbon per hectare per year. And what we were also interested in was the disturbance types that have been recorded on these national forest inventory plots over that period. And we, what we did is we assigned a dominant disturbance type to each one of these plots. So this is just a theoretical example of what this would look like, but we have plots with no disturbance on the landscape, plots with disease disturbance as their dominant type, and plots with insect disturbance as their dominant type. And in some instances, we had plots with multiple disturbance types recorded. In those instances, we took the dominant type, and it had to be at least 5% higher than the next highest. Um, disturbance on that particular plot to be considered dominant. If they were too close to call, we removed those plots from analysis. The other important thing to remember is that a disturbance type is recorded when there is evidence of mortality or damage to 25% of the trees or 50% of an individual species count since the last measurement and the disturbance is at least 0.4 hectares in size. This will become important later on when I talk about some of the limitations of this approach. So let's get at that first question. Has insect and disease disturbance reduced the capacity of U.S. forests to sequester carbon? If we look at plots that had no disturbance, this is what we see. So this map is showing essentially an aggregated area of plots across the United States. And what you'll notice is that the majority of those plots are in these shades of green, which indicate that those plots are sequestering carbon. What I also want to emphasize is that for the Rocky Mountain states, we did not have a second measurement to go by to actually determine that rate of change through time. So we had to exclude that from our, those states from our models. If we look at insect disturbance, this is what we see. We don't see as many plots in those shades of green. They're more now in the shades of brown, which means that they are not sequestering as much carbon as those plots with no disturbance. And similarly, with disease disturbance, we see a similar trend in certain areas where plots with disease disturbance are not sequestering as much carbon. So I think we can say for this first question that the answer is yes, that insect and disease disturbance has reduced the capacity of U.S. forests to sequester carbon. But the more, in question, more important question here is by how much? And to do that, we estimated the average annual change in live tree bi biomass on NFI plots. And here's what we found. So for plots with no disturbance, on average, they sequestered 1.44 megagrams carbon per hectare per year. For disease disturbance, they sequestered on average 1.04 megagrams carbon per hectare per year. And for 
insect disturbance, they sequestered about 0.45 micrograms carbon per hectare per year. Now, if we consider plots with no disturbance to be at that 100% capacity to sequester carbon, that means that disease disturbed plots were only about at 72% of that capacity and insect disturbed plots were only about 31% of that capacity. We also wanted to estimate the level of impact that's happening nationally in any given year. So for this, we did bring in data from the Rocky Mountain states from the initial measurement. So this was used to estimate the amount of forest area that's impacted in any particular year by insect or disease disturbance. We, again, we could not include data from these states in our models to generate those estimates of change because we didn't have a second measurement available. So all of the, the models utilize data from all the other states. But here's what we found. For insects, we saw an annual reduction of about 9.33 teragrams carbon per hectare per year. So we're, we're using a different order of magnitude here. And for disease disturbance, we're, we saw a 3.49 reduction teragrams carbon per hectare per year for a total of about 12.83 teragrams carbon per year across the United States. And so I know that's abstract and difficult to conceptualize what that actually means. So I wanna just demonstrate what level of reduction we're talking about here. So that's reducing the US forest carbon sequestration capacity by about 9% annually, or it's about equivalent to adding the carbon emissions from over 10 million passenger vehicles annually. So this isn't in a, a small amount. This is a, a meaningful amount that we expect insect and disease disturbance to be affecting our ability to sequester carbon. And we also think that these estimates should be considered conservative. And the main reasons for that are going back to one of the things that I mentioned earlier regarding how the National Forest Inventory defines disturbance. They do not account for low intensity disturbance events. So for example, if we have um, an infestation of a um, leaf feed pest, something like um, a moth. And in between those two measurements, those trees were able to recover. That plot would not be considered disturbed. So we're missing out on a lot of the disturbance events that are um, happening in a short period of time and do not affect the, um, the trees in that plot for, for years. And we lack remeasurement data from the Rocky Mountain states, as I mentioned. And we know that those states are particularly heavily impacted by insect and disease disturbance, but yet we couldn't incorporate that into our model. So, uh, it's hard to say whether that would change our results significantly, given those forests are also slow growing, but it's important to consider. And so I think for my last slide, I'll just quickly touch on the limitations that we ran into. So the first one is the National Forest Inventory does not differentiate between native and non-native insect and disease disturbance. So our results should be indicative of both. Ideally, we would be able to tell whether a plot was impacted by a non-native species or a native species and be able to pull out whether natives or non-natives are having a greater effect on carbon sequestration loss across the United States. We did not have that ability. Hopefully that's something that future research can address. As I mentioned, we're missing root measurement data from the Rocky Mountain State, so I won't go over that again. And we only evaluated change over one remeasurement period. So we don't know whether these levels of reduction that we're seeing are the baseline reduction or whether that rate of reduction is increasing through time. Ideally, we would have an analysis that looks at remeasurements over three or four remeasurement periods so that we could see if this is actually increasing through time. And it does not account for carbon transfers to dead organic matter, soils, or salvaged wood, which can be very important in the carbon cycle. And it does not account for climate change, some extreme weather events, or changes in atmospheric chemistry. So those are other things to consider in interpreting our results. So this work was um, published this past year in Frontiers in Forest and Global Change. Please go and read it at some point. Thank you so much, Brendan. That was a great presentation. And thank you, Lee, for rolling with it and for Brendan for being flexible. No worries, technology challenges happen to the best of us. And so now we're gonna move on to our final presenter for this 
webinar. Dr. Emily Fusco from the USDA Forest Service, Pacific Northwest Research Station. Hello. All right, so my name is Emily Fusco and I'm an ORISE fellow. I'm affiliated with the USDA Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station, the USDA Northwest Climate Hub, and the Western Wildland Environmental Threat Assessment Center. So I have been asked to talk about the intersection between invasive species and climate change and fire. And I'm also going to throw in this human ignition component for today. And I'm also going to just go ahead and turn off my camera from the get-go and hope that I can avoid any technical difficulties like we've seen so far. All right, so I wanna start just by going over what a fire regime is. So for those of you that aren't familiar, a fire regime is the pattern of fire over space and time. So it's usually described using a combination of things such as fire return interval or maybe how many, right? so that's how many years there might be between fires in a defined area. It might also incorporate things like fire severity, which is the amount of vegetation that can be burned during a fire event. And so usually these kinds of metrics are combined to come up with fire regimes. Um, and so this is an example from Land Fire. It shows five different fire regime groups within the U.S. They range from these group one fire regimes that are in the light green color. And these are characterized by short fire return intervals of less than 35 years with low severity. To On the opposite end here, we have this group five that's in red. And that is found primarily in the Northeast, the Southwest, and the Northwest. And this is defined by very infrequent fires, typically over 200 years between events. So ecosystems have these natural fire regimes. And in most places, some amount of fire is a healthy part of what happens within an ecosystem. Now, these fire regimes are defined by three things. So ignition, vegetation, and climate. And we call this kind of our fire regime triangle. But people have the ability to impact fire regimes on all sides of the fire regime triangle. So they can provide additional human ignition sources. They can alter vegetation through the introduction of invasive species. And they can also, as we've been talking about, contribute to climate change. And so I'm gonna start just with a quick look at climate impacts on our wildfire regimes. So over the last 20 years or so, uh, we've seen this increase in both total number of acres burned across the U.S. and the amount of federal spending used to suppress those fires. And you can see that here in the graph on the left. Uh, so there are a few factors, including forest management and previous fire suppression tactics that likely contribute to those observed increases, but they're also being driven by this warmer, drier climate that we have associated with climate change. And we expect that these trends will continue over large scales as the climate continues to change. And we know this about kind of these large scale fire patterns, but I wanna note that smaller scale projections are a bit more difficult to make and have higher levels of uncertainty. So it's kind of the difference between say, predicting that California is gonna see an increase in wildfires versus trying to make some prediction that a specific mountain in Yosemite National Park will see an increase. So the second prediction is much harder to make and has higher levels of uncertainty, but these larger scale patterns are a bit more certain. All right, so we're gonna jump right into invasive species and how that impacts this vegetation portion of what drives our fire regimes. So one of the most notorious examples of this is with cheatgrass invasion in sagebrush ecosystems. So in this cartoon example on the right, we have a sagebrush ecosystem that does not often see fire. And so there are typically big gaps of bare ground between these sagebrush plants. So if there's an ignition in a healthy sagebrush ecosystem, it's very likely gonna 
fall on this bare ground and no fire will happen. Or if it does happen to ignite a shrub, there's not really anything to carry the fire from one shrub to another and the fire would just stop there. But once you add cheatgrass to the system, there's been this addition of a fine fuel source that can readily ignite um, and it provides this continuous fuel that can then carry that fire to more cheatgrass and more shrubs. And that brings us to this infamous grass fire cycle. So that is where we see grass invasion happen. It alters the fuel within an ecosystem that changes the ecosystem's fire regime. And then the new fire regime favors the invasive grass. And so that leads then to further invasion and you get stuck in this feedback loop. And so the ability of cheatgrass to promote fire can be seen at these really large regional scales. So on the right, you can see within the Great Basin where cheatgrass covers over 15% in that dark gray. And you can really see that expands all the way from Washington to Utah and California and Nevada. And it's really prevalent in this region. And so in the graph on the left, you can also see that these places associated with cheatgrass invasion also burn significantly more than those with very little or no cheatgrass cover. And this kind of extensive cheatgrass cover can lead to massive wildfire events. And so this is an image of the Martin fire. It burned in Nevada in the summer of 2018. And so the burn scar here that you see in this this image is roughly 57 miles across. And this fire burned over 400,000 acres and it was carried by cheatgrass in a lot of this area. But I wanna point out that this isn't just a Western US problem. So all of the yellow areas are ones where a fire promoting invasive grass species is present and linked to increases in fire. So that's in addition to Bromus tectorum or cheatgrass, which is in the Great Basin. There are several fire prone invasive grasses that can be found in the Southwest, including buffalo grass, and then also in the Eastern US, and that includes grasses like stilt grass and cocon grass. So in addition to these fire promoting invasive grasses, another really important component of what drives these human caused changes to fire regimes is this human ignition component. So in the US, for example, people are responsible for about 84% of fire ignitions. So in the reddest part of the map here, like in the Southeast US or in Mediterranean California, you can see which places fire regimes are being driven almost entirely by these human ignition sources. And then also even in these blue areas, like some parts of the Great Basin and the Intermountain West, human ignitions are still present, even if they're not the dominant form of ignition in that area. And these human ignition sources can also change the seasonality of our fires. So here you can see in the blue are all of the lightning ignited fires in the US, and they're really concentrated in those summer months. But if you look at the red, those are human ignited wildfires and they make a pretty impressive appearance year round. And they also include this really interesting spike here, which is on the 4th of July. And that underscores this cultural impact that human, that people have on our fire regimes. All right, so we talked about human ignitions and invasive species separately but they also interact and that those interactions also can drive our fire regimes. And that's another important area to consider. As it turns out, um, since invasive species are introduced by people, they often have this really strong association with human features. So in the graph on the left here, you can see that cheatgrass is most likely to occur near roads and that the probability of occurrence decreases as you move away from roads. And then that's also true of our human ignition sources. So we can, we tend to ignite fires in these places that we move through the places we live in and recreate in. And so you can see in the map on the right that all of those kind of red dots there, those denote fires and they are closest to the black lines, which are our highways. 
so it's likely that part of the reason why we see so many fires in these grass invaded areas, in addition to these areas having susceptible fuel sources, it's also because grass invasion is co-occurring with high levels of these human ignition sources. And the combination of human ignitions and invasions can also impact fire seasonality. And so here you can see in this plot on the right that human ignited fires in cheatgrass, they tend to occur around 10 days earlier in the year than those ignited where cheatgrass is absent. And this strong 4th of July signature is seen here too, but that's really only standing out in these darker colors here in places where cheatgrass is present and le very much less so in places where cheatgrass is absent. So moving on now to this combination of human ignition, uh, human ignition and climate change. So I'm gonna provide just one example of this. One event is this Chimney Tops 2 fire. So this burned in Gatlinburg, Tennessee in 2016. And so the magnitude of this fire was very likely impacted by the extended dry period leading up to the fire event. Uh, and it made the Southern Appalachian forest much more susceptible to a catastrophic fire event. And then when a human ignition source was added to the mix, we ended up with this, this massive event. And I just also want to point out that in general, the Southeast U.S. and similar to the Western U.S. is expected to see increased fire risk in a lot of these areas and increased fire season with climate change. And now we can move on here to this next intersection. So how invasive species and climate change interact. So one important aspect of these interactions is related to the invasive grass fire cycle. And so this schematic on the right describes these interactions. So for example, a change in climate could create favorable conditions for cheatgrass, including a decrease in freezing days and an increase in the frequency of wet winters, which is something that will help cheatgrass thrive. And then on the other side here, we might see a, se a fire season with increased fire danger, and that could lead to an increased wildfire potential. And all of these climatic changes would then feed into this grass fire cycle on the bottom here where that's bolded. And so that could exacerbate these kind of grass fire cycle impacts. And as was noted earlier by Carrie, invasive species are also expected to shift their ranges with a changing climate. And so this is just one example of a fire promoting grass, which is buffalo grass in the desert Southwest. And these are just some projections in the map on the left that suggest that uh, while its range may decrease in some areas, it does have potential to become a threat in new places that might not be ready or equipped to deal with this invasive species and some, some of the problems that it can cause. So invasive plants aren't the only group that will likely interact with climate change to drive fire regimes. So this example comes from the Sierra Nevada region of California and actually involves a native bark beetle. But what happened was a long-term drought made some of the trees in this area more susceptible to bark beetle outbreak. And it led to this unprecedented tree mortality, which then resulted in changes in stand structure that have led to this increased wildfire risk. So it's important to know that there's still a lot of uncertainty surrounding climate change impacts on forest pests and pathogens. And also that these impacts and subsequent impacts on wildfire are very likely gonna be species and ecosystem dependent. And so it's also important now to think about how these increased wildfires from climate change might impact invasive species. So not just how invasive species are going to impact wildfire. So this comes from a meta-analysis that showed that exotic species tend to have a more positive response to wildfire than native species. And you can see on the left, or yeah, you can see so that in heathland, desert shrubland, wildfire had a significant negative effect on native plants. But in the plot on the right, 
it had a significant positive effect on exotic species in desert shrubland, heathland, and temperate forest. So looking back at our fire regime triangle, uh, you can see how people have impacts on all sides here. And you can also see how often there are going to be interactions by each of these sides that impact our fire regimes in new ways. Uh, so to conclude, people impact fire regimes through climate change, invasive species, and ignition sources. That these three sides to the fire regime triangle interact. Generally, we can think that these interactions are going to promote increased fire risk in longer fire seasons, but the specifics around that are a bit more difficult to predict, and they're going to be dependent on geography, species, and the affected ecosystem. Thank you. I wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to talk about the fact that like, these are two huge problems. Each one of them alone seems overwhelming and insurmountable. And then together, that actually seems worse. But I think together, and as we start understanding the science and all this great work that's being done by people like Emily and Brendan and Lee and all the researchers that are addressing these issues, we can also put our policy and management heads together and start thinking about ways we can address these interacting problems. And so I just, starting back off where I left off with this diagram that Bethany Bradley et al. put out a couple of years ago in 2020, I just wanted to highlight some of the areas that we've been discussing with managers and policymakers through workshops at how we can address these issues. And then do a brief overview on the risk network where we're actually all coming together in a platform to be able to address this jointly. So this will only be a really quick 10 minutes, but I just wanted to make sure we thought about this together before we wrap up. So as we're starting to seek solutions for the, these interacting effects, one area that we can think about addressing climate change and invasives is through strategic plans. We could be including invasive species consideration in climate change adaptation plans. Every state, every county has these and federally as well. And we can think about ways to make sure that's considered. We can plan and provide resources for invasive species detection and management in climate change response plans. And we can also identify and prioritize vulnerable areas for invasion that would be potentially impacted by climate change as well. We can also think about ways prevention is the best policy, of course, and we can think about ways to prevent some of these introductions. Uh, to begin with, planting climate resilient native species instead of introduced species in horticulture can avoid sleeper species issues and make our habitats more resilient. We can implement pathway prevention programs. NASMA offers a number of these, like Play Clean Go. We can think about boat washing, but also considering federal level prevention programs. Considering, consider creating a watch list to keep an eye out for rain shifting species. Now I mentioned that there are projections. We do have an idea of which species are likely to move where based on climate projections and um, keeping those in mind. We can use the EDMAPS rain shifting online tool. This actually is something that tells you where, what species are likely to move into where so we can keep an eye out and maybe regulate those species proactively before they become invasive species in an area. How can we change our treatment and control efforts? We can adapt to shifts in growing seasons, adjust treatment times for invasive species control efforts to be earlier in the season or extend later. We can expand watercraft inspection and decontamination stations as well. We might need to expand our toolbox a little and incorporate resistance in diverse treatment methods. And also we can conduct rapid response, be on the ball with our treatments when we know that new species are moving in. Education and outreach. There's a lot of new information, those of you that are sitting in on this webinar, but there's a lot of new information coming out through the NIST risk network as well to keep up to date on these interactions between climate and invasives and consider them as you're making your management plans. 
and also share your knowledge and best practices with your colleagues and stakeholders to address the issue. And we've been working a lot with, with managers from states to our south that are already dealing with some of our upcoming species so that we can more effectively address them when they show up. And participate in groups like NASMA and also the Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Network that's in your region, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then in terms of policy, when drafting legislation, policy plans, or making management decisions, consider these impacts and also allocate resources for them. Strengthen existing regulations to further reduce introduction of invasive species through international trade and tourism that's into the United States, but also be proactive to include the regulation of potent future range shifters. So once they're already here, but just making their way into new areas. And then streamline the process. A lot of times the regulatory process is so slow that we don't get a leg up and get things done before, before species are moving in. So really quickly, if you're interested in getting more involved in learning more about this and becoming part of a network that's trying to address these issues, I just wanted to highlight the work of my, me and my colleagues at the Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network. We founded this back in 2016, like I mentioned, to address managers' requests for how to manage the biological invasions in light of climate change. And we have a mission to reduce the compounding effects of invasive species and climate change by synthesizing relevant science, communicating the needs of managers to researchers, building stronger scientists, manager communities, and conducting priority research. Our network in the Northeast alone has grown up to over 600 invasive species researchers and managers. And we have a great team of folks from UMass and Cornell, as well as others who want to get involved that are helping to advance these efforts. Um, if you're interested in seeing more about what RISC does, we do have a guiding principles document, but I just wanted to highlight some of the main areas we work are in boundary spanning to connect researchers and managers so that we can collectively try to come up with solutions and increase our knowledge. We conduct original research on these issues within our group, and we also promote that research to happen outside of our group. We synthesize existing research so that managers and people who aren't regularly scanning the journals can have access to this information without having to dig deep into scientific literature. And these get posted on our website and also on our listserv, so you can get a bite-sized piece of science every other week in your inbox, as well as more comprehensive synthesis documents that we call management challenges. And we also host regular webinars. Our next webinar is on kudzu with a management and research perspective as it marches its way north. That'll be March 23rd, but we have an annual symposium. We have other tools available to, to get people connected and to hear more information. So just, I know this is a national presentation, although the risk started in the Northeast here, we're really excited to see it's been expanding and is being replicated in other regions. So there's now a North Central risk, a specific, a Pacific Islands risk, a Northwest risk, and a Southeast risk is actually being established as we speak. And so no matter where you are in the country, you're definitely invited to get involved. We encourage you to get involved and to help contribute to this. So just in wrapping up here, you know, climate change definitely creates new risks from invasive species, and invasive species are contributing to climate change, but this is also an opportunity for us to work together and share knowledge and try to prevent further invasion and reduce these combined impacts of invasive species and climate change. Um, definitely an invitation to all to join our network, check out our website, and thanks so much for joining today, and I'm happy to stick around and answer questions forever however much time we have. I thank my colleagues for their great presentations and also for NASMA for taking the lead on coordinating all this great information and webinars for National Invasive Species Awareness Week. So with that, I'll wrap up and pass it back to Belle. Thank you so much, Carrie. Again, great presentations all around. We have a, just a few minutes left for some questions. So several have been answered in the Q&A. So hop over there and uh, because we just have limited time, I'm going to try to get to as many of these uh, ones that have not been answered yet. 
so I'll go down from the top. Has there has any relationship between herbicides mode of action and a reduced efficient efficacy under climate change conditions been observed? Photosynthesis inhibitors, et cetera. Anyone aware of that? I don't have detailed information on that, but that's a great question. And I'll definitely look into it for future presentations. And I think some of that may be in, included in some in the position paper that we put out through, okay. through, the, through NASMA. Okay, very good. How does the change of carbon sequestration of North American forests, is it, how is it attributed to climate change compared to the effects of historic deforestation? for croplands and development. I can jump in on this one because it's a <clears throat> very relevant to the work. So this is Lee Greenwood. And there's so many different factors going into forest carbon sequestration. The regeneration of the northeastern quadrant of the United States forests from the historical land use patterns of agriculture is actually one of the greatest forest sequestration success stories in the world. But we have to do all the things to tackle climate change. And so even though we are seeing truly remarkable amounts over the course of the last 200 years of forest carbon sequestration in the Northeast, we are also seeing truly remarkable numbers of forest pests reducing the growth of that forest. Um, so it's a multifactorial issue. I don't have numbers, unfortunately, to answer your question, Keith, but it's a really good one. There's so many things going on simultaneously. Great. Thank you, Lee. Okay, next one. This is to Brendan. How did or does or will forest management techniques, private, mostly private in the East and public in the West, impact your findings and projections? So let me clarify that our results weren't a projection. It was looking back in time over the past two measurements and what has happened over that period of time. It wouldn't change our results from the past, but going forward, forest management, as I think Lee mentioned, has major implications for whether our forest will continue to serve as major carbon sinks or potentially sources. So there are major implications for forest management that need to be considered here going forward. Great. And with that, we're going to wrap up because we are at our time. So I want to thank everyone again, all our presenters and sponsors of National Invasive Species Awareness Week for supporting this webinar series. If you are not a member of NASMA yet, I encourage you to check out the additional resources that are available to members. Um, please join us. We aim to be your voice for invasive species management in North America. And with that, I will leave you with a slide of all of our fantastic presenters again. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again at a future NISA or NASMA webinar. Have a great rest of the day.